Professor Pentland. Thank you very mm -hmm. much for taking the time for My this pleasure. interview. Uh, you developed the concept of social physics, and you coined this term. And you said you're aiming at creating organizations and governments that are cooperative, productive, and creative. This sounds marvelous. What is social physics? What's the key well, concept behind it? So social physics is actually 200 years old, and it's French originally. Uh, and about the time that alchemy turned into chemistry, people came up with this notion of social physics, which was using statistics to understand society. And that's why we have, for instance, a census in every country, is those are the, the numbers, the data, that allow us to do statistics to see how the country is going. And that was fine for almost 200 years, uh, but now there's all this data, and there's very, very uh, advanced ways of doing statistics, machine learning, AI, things like that. And so the question comes up, can we do a better job of understanding our societies, our companies, using data and statistics? And the answer is yes. There's a long tradition of sociology or social sciences. Why do you call it social physics and refer to science in the natural science way? Social physics back in the early 1800s uh, was the dream and they did census. And then they realized they didn't really have enough data or good enough statistics. And so they changed the name to be sociology because it was the study of more the sort of philosophy and basic processes, not the actual thing itself as it is at the moment. Um, and so this doesn't replace sociology. Sociology is trying to understand some of the basic trends and natures and influences. Uh, this instead complements it uh, to be able to look at society as it is or companies as they are and understand how those basic mechanisms play out in the real world today. What do we learn from social physics about our own behavior as individuals? Or what can we learn from social physics for ourselves? The main lesson, I think, is this, is that in the last century, century and a half, um, we've adopted governments, management, all sorts of things that think of people only as rational individuals, as you yourself said. How can we understand individuals? What social physics teaches us is, is that's only half the story. Half of the other half of the story is what we often call culture. So we learn from each other, we copy each other, we negotiate peace with each other, norms of behavior, and that actually accounts for the majority of our behavior. If you know the culture that they're part of, then you know a lot about the habits of people like that. So, um, you know, if I see what all the people that you hang out with do, you probably do the same. But it's not certain. You have individual agency also. So there are those two parts to humanity. We tend to think about the individual part, but the culture part is just as strong. So I can get about halfway to predicting what you'll do based on the, what the people around you do. And then the rest is your individual decisions, which, which even if I had all sorts of stuff about your searches and what you said online, even if I had all that, I still couldn't predict it. Our management, our governments, are not actually set up to take a, a notice of this culture. Now, that was okay back in 1880 or even 1920 when things moved very slow. Uh, but today, things move very quickly. Communication is extremely broad. And so what we get is we get fads and panics and change at an enormous rate. And we can no longer ignore the fact that these norms of behavior between us often don't keep up or often push us into sort of panic mode. And when you begin to think about that, you realize that a lot of the things that we do are wrong because they don't take into account the social fabric. Are these social fabrics emerging phenomena, or do we design or co-design them? Well, we design them as a collective, so I guess you would call it co-design. It's something where uh, all of our interactions reach a, a norm, a habit that we do. Uh, and incidentally, this is not new. 
Adam Smith said that was the uh, invisible hand. It's not markets that's the invisible hand. It's this interactions between people. And Karl Marx said the same thing. He said society is the sum of social interactions. So this is a very old idea, but we've sort of forgotten it. And uh, I think it's time to sort of get back to that. So let me give you an example. Um, when the social media was first created, everyone said, oh, wonderful, because this will give people a chance to express themselves anywhere. Anybody can hear anything, right? And we're all very optimistic. But in fact, what happens is we only talk to particular people, uh, people that are like us. That's the norm in the social fabric part. And so we get echo chambers. And now you get these, these fantasies collected by different chunks of people that aren't compatible with each other, and you get all sorts of disturbance in society, polarization, fake news, all sorts of things, because we didn't think about when we designed these things that uh, it's this sort of flow of ideas, this sort of agreement about what's true and what's not true that actually defines the way we think and what we do. We were using this model of rational individuals who carefully consider things and have access to objective facts. Just not the whole story. We actually are social, and the social fabric emerges from our interactions, and it makes a real difference. Did I get it right that social physics and this kind of analysis of data fabric is something completely different than markets? Yes. It's so what, what's the fundamental difference between social physics and markets? So social physics is the understanding of people um, as a social fabric, as a collective. And the idea that it's not static, it's continually evolving. It's like we're a living organism. And we, we today forget that when we do the analysis, when we set policy, when we think about things. So the social fabric is a phenomenon which happens between individuals. Can it be designed? Can it be co-designed? And what are the consequences for policy making? So it comes from people interacting, which means everybody has their own incentives or their, their utility, what they enjoy, and, the, and they find a, a medium which is a good compromise. So if you change somebody's uh, incentives, you change the fabric. So um, an example of something we've done is uh, just to make it socially visible when someone spends uh, more energy in their house than is average just so your neighbors know, right? Um, and it turns out that that's very effective at getting people to save energy. Similarly, um, we looked at bus drivers driving, and we just made it visible to each other uh, about whether they were driving smoothly or, uh, you know, sort of jerkily and therefore unsafe. And just having a reputation makes it much more of a subject of attention and changes the social fabric. Well, what is then your opinion about the Chinese social scoring system? Because also this makes publicly visible the behavior of the individual to its peers. So in our society, um, we have lots of mechanisms like that. So in the U.S. we have a credit score, so you can look up how good somebody's payment is. We have uh, criminal records, so I can see if you went to jail. Uh, we can see if you were certified to be uh, a doctor, right? So we have all these reputational mechanisms. The Chinese had no mechanisms like that at all. And as a consequence, they felt that they were having a very lawless society where lots of people were being taken advantage of. And you can see, is that a real doctor or not? Right? There's no way to answer it. So what they thought they would do is set up what they would call a trust society. And that was going to be the basis of their society. And they would do that by making visible to each other the sort of behavior that they had. Did you pay back your loans? Did you cheat people? Things like that. But the problem with what they did is that you couldn't really understand your score. Your score went down. Why? I don't really know. It went down sometimes for things that you wouldn't anticipate. And so it really was not just a, a score, uh, it was this sort of arbitrary thing. Moreover, the reputations we have are for public actions. 
right? Like, did you cheat somebody in a business thing? It's not something you do at home. Whereas theirs included home behavior. So that sort of gets rid of privacy, okay? But it's interesting to think about the role of reputation in society, and I think we don't think about that enough. You can imagine some things that might make sense. So, for instance, um, in many countries, there are these things called conditional cash transfer. So if you're a young woman with young children and you go to the doctor for care and your kids go to school, you get a check in the mail for a certain amount of money. So it's a reputation mechanism, right? But most people feel like that's pretty good because the kids get treated well and it's better for society. But yet it is Big Brother spying on that woman. So where's the line? Do you think that there are some severe differences between the American, the Chinese, and the European approach to the social fabric and also the data privacy issues? There are real differences. So one of the fundamental things uh, between Europe and the U.S. is the difference between Napoleonic law, where the government gives you permission to do things, and the uh, sort of English common law, where you can do anything except what the government prohibits. So in Europe, when you create a law, you think about all the bad things and you say, only these are permitted. In the United States, they wait for harm. and They say, that's a harm, it's against the law. Okay, But actually, the fundamental rights seem to be much the same in the U.S. and in Europe. In China, they're actually very concerned about privacy in the following sense. They're worried that their companies are abusing their citizens. But the government, in their view, has rights to everything. There is no privacy to the government. Don't even bring it up, right? Uh, and so that's a very different attitude than the United States, where actually the main concern is privacy from the government. There seem to be three different ways of approaching data privacy. And by that, the basics of social physics, the American way of having data and the benefits of data in the hand of big companies, the Chinese way having the data in the hand of the state, and there seems to be an emerging third way in Europe where the data is in the hand of the people. Do you share this view? I think the most interesting way to think about it is to ask, has this happened before? And I'll point out that in around 1900, the year 1900, um, you had a few big corporations that were monopolizing labor and uh, to the detriment of citizens. And what citizens did in each of these places is they formed unions. Uh, and even earlier than that, there were banks that were distorting the money and uh, the result was sort of company, uh, countrywide banks, central banks, but also credit unions. So it was collective action by the people to force the companies and the state to behave. And I think the same thing can happen here. So if data is the new oil or the new money, the new resource, why don't we have collective action? It turns out that credit unions are actually already legally empowered to do this in Europe and the U.S. Uh, and uh, they could just start managing people's data for them. Because credit unions are owned by the people. They're not owned by corporations. So GDPR, which I am proud to have been an important part in starting that discussion, gives you the right to hold your data, but having your data doesn't do much for you. But if I had 100,000 people in my town who all had their data and we could look at it and say, hey, you know, this medical operation doesn't help anybody. Right? Then we could go to the hospitals and demand better service. Or if somebody was paying people wrong, um, we could go to them and demand it because we'd have the proof. So I think this, this collective action through data co-ops is a very interesting idea, and it may eventually go that way. Uh, irrespective of the law, this is sort of a political action, as it were, that's based in ownership of data. I think for the moment this data which is collected is behavioral data about what you buy, about where you are and with whom you communicate.
So this is the data that I'm aware of that's collected. Mm -hmm. But there will be much more data when we talk about health data, when we talk about Internet of Things, sure. when we talk about smart homes in the future. Yeah. Do you see there is any need of change with the sheer number of data points increase as dramatically as it's foreseen? The main change is, is you should be able to maintain uh, control over your data, right? So smart homes shouldn't send data someplace else. It should stay under your control where you can decide who can look at what for what purposes. Uh, same thing with your car, same thing with your medical, on and on and on. It shouldn't be their data. It should be your data, right? Now, the difficulty with that is that's really complicated. How can you possibly do that? But I, I'll say the same thing is true of money. How do I invest money? How do I make sure things get paid correctly? Well, I have this thing called a bank, which is licensed by the government and regulated and audited that takes care of all that complexity for me. I put my money in, bills get paid, they go to the right people. Uh, you know, I get some interest, not much, but it's safe, et cetera, et cetera. The same thing needs to happen with data. There need to be people that represent us in doing that, just like there's representing with, with money. So this means also we need some institutions to balance the power of the big IT companies. That's right. You need new institutions. Mm -hmm. and, and the ones I'm suggesting are some sort of bank of data that's owned by people where you have the ability of collective action. And the government, of course, needs to audit that to make sure that it's, it's being the correct sort of thing and, and establish the best sort of policies. So looking forward for five to ten years, which is the area that you're most curious about in new data being the basis of social physics? One is health. In fact, we don't know what behaviors result in disease or ill health and what behaviors result in uh, a more sort of creative, flourishing life. Uh, and that's because health usually studies sickness, not the good part. Right? And uh, so we need to begin to understand more holistically how behavior translates into results. So that's one side of things. The other side of things is um, what is the source of successful creativity, of innovation that really goes? And uh, the social physics views, it has to do with sharing and this iteration of, of ideas and not so much with schools and skills and investment and things like that. But, of course, society is not set up that way. And, and to be able to see what rides the right mix that leads to innovation is, uh, I think, an enormous problem. It's something that Europe stresses about. It's why aren't there more innovative, world-beating companies? Well, let's study that and find out. We did a study in China, which was interesting, so we looked at all of the startups in all of China. That's pretty amazing, right? And this is the government doing this, of course. And they asked all these questions about it. And do you know what the single most important uh, factor was in uh, success of a startup? It was cultural diversity. Cultural diversity? What does that mean? Well, in China, what that means is people had different experiences in not only different parts of China, but outside China. So when you brought these very different views together, that was the most important factor. The second most important factor was skill diversity. So you had people that were engineers and liberal arts and this and that and the other thing all in the team. So it's all about diversity, not in the sense of, you know, sort of gender or, or color of skin, although that's important, uh, but in the sense of bringing different perspectives and different skills to the table. If the sheer number of data will increase during the next years and big data will be applied nearly every, in every part of our lives, do you see any kind of risks, emerging risks as well? Well, the, the obvious risk is around privacy or around security. If everything is digital, then digital attacks become very, very important. And that's why uh, this framework that we call open algorithms uh, which keeps data where it is rather than spreading it around, gives you control over data rather than letting it sort of drift off, is so important. And I'm glad to say that in the EU, people are taking this seriously. So uh, I keynoted the EU presidency opening in Estonia on this subject. You had me lecturing 
all of the ministers of the single digital market, uh, keynoted uh, Eurostat, which is all the internal systems for all the countries, who have adopted this framework that is much safer and gives you much more control over things. So that's the good news. Um, the bad news is, is that you're going to see uh, people exploiting this often in ways that we don't like, including the government. So we need to, in the next, say, 20 years, uh, be very vigilant about what's a legitimate use and what's not a legitimate use. When we discuss about risks of data abuse, we often talk about advertisement. Mm -hmm. And then the abuse is that any kind of pop-up window opens and tries to sell me any stuff. I wouldn't call this really abuse, it's just a little bit of bothering me. But there might be other examples where data can really be abused. So Cambridge Analytica was one of them. Uh, so they were using big data to manipulate people on a really large scale. What kind of other abuse could we imagine? The Cambridge Analytica thing is interesting uh, because it's an example of not using big data for ads, but for political manipulation. Uh, my personal opinion about Cambridge Analytica is that it's not that bad, right? They didn't have that much effect. They have a very bad reputation in terms of being effective, is what I'm saying. But what they were doing is truly bad. However, all the political parties do it, not just Cambridge Analytica. In this country, both the Democrats and the Republicans and everybody does it. And I find that really scary, the idea that the people in power can use this sort of micro-targeting to the citizens to get them to vote for them, to keep them in power. How can social physics help to address grand societal challenges as sustainable development? With the sustainable development goals, um, they noticed that the previous goals, the Millennium Goals, the ones you could measure they achieved progress on, the ones you couldn't measure, nothing happened. So that's as the sort of obvious as you ought to be able to measure all these things. But how do you measure inequality? How do you measure poverty on a fine grain? How do you measure all these sorts of things? And uh, that's where social physics comes in. Social physics gives you a way to actually make estimates of these things. You can't measure them directly, but you can get proxies for them. And so the sustainable development goals include measurement of 169 things uh, that allow you to judge progress on the sustainable development goal. So it's doing the first part of a feedback loop where countries are now transparently uh, audited and held accountable to what they're doing. Okay. Okay, good. Thank you very much. My pleasure. My pleasure.